How involved is God in our lives? Does he actually notice every sparrow that falls? Or did he create the earth and all that exists on it, only to leave it in our hands and periodically return to check on how we're doing? These are questions that have plagued mankind for millennia. Prophets depended on God's involvement. Deists depended on God's lack of involvement. And atheists depended on the notion that there was no God. Yet, if there is no God, or He randomly comes and goes, how do we account for the myriad of unusual events that happen in our lives? Does God actually intervene? Are there depths or levels of His intervention? Is the intervention only at the angelic level, such as the time God sent His angel to destroy 185,000 men of Assyria to save Hezekiah? Or can humans have some involvement, such as the time when Aaron and Hur held up the arms of Moses, and as long as his arms were up, they won, and when his arms were down, the Hebrew army would lose? If you stop to think about it, aren't we actually asking God to intervene in something every time we pray? Shouldn't that too be considered divine intervention? On the other hand, many people like myself met their wife or spouse in a -a once-in-a-lifetime moment a chance encounter that could not have happened at any other time. On a scale of life and death, others have failed to board an airplane that crashed because they were stuck in traffic. Did God stop all that traffic just to save one life? Still others applied for the job they got because they happened to hear a conversation while standing in line at the local coffee shop. Was that God who orchestrated all those events? Less noticeable might be how life could have drastically changed had you gone to the game with your friend or taken your normal route home, but you didn't. Whatever the reason, there are many monumental or abnormal times when life suddenly changes. The question is, how much was God involved in it? The reality is, on many occasions, we might not notice God was involved at all. On other occasions, We can't stop giving God thanks for what He did. God does act in mysterious ways. After all, isn't every act of God, as well as every miracle, part of the mystery of divine intervention? is Dreams and Mysteries with John Paul Jackson. Throughout the Bible, especially the New Testament, we find many reasons that God intervenes in the lives of people by performing miracles, signs, wonders, many, many things. A few of those reasons have been to validate divine commission given to the disciples or to verify that the Holy Spirit has been given to give power to men, to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and to prove that God is greater than those who defy God's commands. The very fact that while we were yet sinners, God sent His Son to die for us is divine intervention at the highest level there is. At the opposite end of the spectrum, are believers who view virtually everything as an example of divine intervention. A good parking spot being open is God's divine intervention. And by the way, I do like good parking spots. A sudden gust of wind or the chance meeting of a friend at the store might be seen as a real sign from God. Still, there are those times when the meaningless takes on greater meaning. A friend of mine once lost his prescription sunglasses, which made driving on a sunny day rather painful to his eyes. Not quite prone to thinking about God in moments like this, maybe about irritation, but not so much about God, he desperately actually cried out to God, a little embarrassed to tell me about it, and he asked for divine help in finding those sunglasses. The next day, in a corner of the newspaper, this line appeared in the Helpful Hints sidebar. Can't find your sunglasses? Check under the front seat of the driver's side. 
Well, something happened. He got up and he went out and looked under the front driver's seat and there they were. You would have thought he checked it, but apparently he hadn't. Anyway, while this mindset is more biblical than we might want to admit, it can pose problems because interpreting virtually everything that happens to us as divine intervention can lead to some very subjective conclusions and a lot of wild goose chases. While there may not be hidden spiritual meanings in everyday life events, all the time anyway, we should be aware God really does speak and intervene continually in all of our lives. Still, we shouldn't spend every waking minute trying to decode secret messages from above. Yes, God can do anything He wants and does use the seemingly inconsequential to change lives. However, I believe divine intervention goes much further than that. While it's hard to say exactly what level of acts of God can be equated to divine intervention, the scripture seems to indicate that there is a level of divine intervention that produces a large basket of fruit in the lives of others. Nations are changed, bloodlines come into relationship with a God they once were estranged from, children are born who become great men and women of God and in turn change the lives of others. My calling into the ministry came as the result of a divine intervention. When I was 30 years old, I was already successful in a Fortune 500 corporation where I had just been promoted for the third time in 18 months. I was listening to a Christian radio program where a woman who lived in Israel was being interviewed, and she was telling a remarkable story, a story of how an angel came to her in Jerusalem in a dream and told her step by step how she was going to get up and go to the Tel Aviv airport. There she would wait and a man would give her a ticket to, the, to go to Dallas. She waited for a couple of hours and a man walks up to her and says, are you going to the United States? She answered, yes. He said, are, do you have your ticket? And she said, no. And he said, do you have money for your ticket? And she goes, no. And he says, are you going to Dallas? And she goes, yes. And he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a rubber band roll of dollar bills or money and throws it at her and says, here, take it, and stomps off. Now, the woman, this woman was Ruth Ward Heflin. And she writes about this particular incident in a book that she wrote on the glory of God. I never got to meet Ruth Ward Heflin. She passed away before I got to meet her. So we never got to compare our stories. All I know is I was sent the book that she wrote about this incident in, and so I'm telling it to you. So she goes and buys a ticket. She gets to the radio station in Dallas, Texas, goes into the manager, tells them the story, and tells them that she's to do a live call-in program for three days on dreams and visions. The angel told her that there was a young man who would call in and that this young man had a gift in dreams and visions but was resisting God's call on his life. So she told her the remarkable, these remarkable events, reiterated them and how she got to the airport and got the money and got on the airplane, and now here she was, at the station. So she went to the station and the station happened to say, we have programs that are open on the exact dates you need due to the vacation of the normal host and the inability of the substitute host to fill in on those dates. She began to talk on, on dreams and visions, doing her program, people were calling in, and she talked about how they related to the Bible. And she constantly asked the young man to call in. I, of course, began to pray for that, that young man to call in because I knew that he was resisting God's call. If God had done this for this woman, that this young man needed to listen to the radio or, or tune in somehow, it needed to happen. And prayer was a way to make that work. Well, the program was interesting, and for the following two days, I would listen and pray for that young man to call in. And dozens of young men did call in but they were not the one she was looking for. I heard her say over and over, you may have a gift, but you're not the young man. I know you've got a gift, but you're not the young man, over and over. 
In an unusual turn of events, I found myself weeping more and more for this young man every day. And I'm at that time, I wasn't known as a weeper at all. I was far from it. Finally, on the third day of the program, with 10 minutes left, myself wailing with tears that I couldn't understand, I heard a voice talking to me and asking me to call in. I didn't want to, and I thought it was a waste of my time, so I argued with God. I told him, I don't have dreams like these people who are calling in, and he simply told me, go ahead, call in. Son, go ahead, call in. So I tossed a fleece back out to God. Yes, I would call in, but if I connected to the switchboard, I was going to hang up. If this was, in fact, God telling me to do this, then he'd have to get me past the switchboard where they were putting everybody on hold. I would have to hear the words, you're live on the air, or I was going to hang up. And I felt safe because I thought that this was too hard even for God to do. Even though I was stunned when I heard the dreaded words, you're live on the air, I was even more stunned when I heard the words I was never expecting to hear. Young man, what took you so long to call? You're the young man I was sent here for. Well, of course, I argued that I was not that young man. I was not resisting God's call on my life. I was very happy in the corporate world and God had blessed me. She kept insisting I was the young man because the same voice who told her to come to Dallas was telling her I was that young man. And my arguing only proved the depth of my resistance. The call ended with her asking me, what are you going to do now? It must be very important to God for him to bring me all the way from Israel just for you. That day forever changed my life. I'd like to be able to tell you that I quit my job the following day, but it took me three years to make the final separation from corporate life to ministry life. And even then, it took some outside help from my employer who said I reminded them of my boss who they had just fired. Did I miss God? Did I wait too long? I don't know. But what I do know is that when I did not make the final move, God did. I became part of the corporate house cleaning process after top executives are removed. I suppose one might say God had to act twice to get me to act once. I'm proof of his great mercy. Divine intervention, I'm all for it. And I think it happens far more than we might think. We hope you're enjoying Dreams and Mysteries with John Paul Jackson. In addition to watching the show, there are many great reasons to visit dreamsandmysteries.com. Watch any episode, anytime you want. Download detailed teaching notes. See exclusive content not seen on TV and behind the scenes footage. Purchase featured music from the show and even audio versions of episodes and more. Go to dreamsandmysteries.com today. I'm here today because God has intervened and spared my life, not just once on a number of occasions, but this time on a rain-soaked day in Los Angeles, I had another divine intervention. I was involved in an eight-car pileup on the 405 freeway, and those of you that live in LA know what that might be like. In the process of the collisions, I found myself trapped under a large 18-wheel truck where I was being dragged toward the railing of a bridge and that bridge crossed a freeway that was down below. As I hit the protective curb just before the bridge railing, I was launched into the air and through that very railing. I was praying knowing that the only question was this, would I die from the fall to the freeway below, or would I die from being hit by the cars hurtling forward in the traffic that I was about to fall into? As I clung to the steering wheel, I could feel the nose of the car headed down, down toward the freeway. When I suddenly found myself back onto the very freeway I had just left, I was standing on the surface of the bridge, or the car was on the surface of the bridge. Stunned, I sat there for just a moment when several people came running and told me to quickly, quickly get out of the car because the gas tank was leaking. Well, with the engine of my car now sitting by my right knee, I began looking for a way out. 
As I looked around, all the doors were crushed in from the collisions that I'd been in, and I noticed the rear passenger door was open just enough for me to squeeze through and get out. As I did, I ran from the car to a spot about 50 feet away when a number of people came up to me telling me the amazing events they had just seen. One man said it like this, Senor, I do not believe in God, but Senor, he said in broken English, you went over the bridge using these hand motions. You went over the bridge and we're going down. And my wife and I, we both saw the hand of God reach down, grab your car and pull you back onto the surface of the bridge. Senor, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. And as he was finishing the last of his statement, a dozen or more people all began to say they had seen the same thing. And right there, in the middle of the LA 405, I gave my first altar call. I told them it was the protective hedge of God that has saved my life. And they could have the same hedge of protection around them. All they had to do was accept Jesus as the son of God. And there, in the pouring rain, in the middle of an LA freeway, more than a dozen people knelt on the concrete to give their life to Jesus. I'll probably never know the full reality of what happened on that L.A. freeway until I get to heaven. But lives were changed because God intervened. And I'm here today because he did. Divine intervention. When a miracle happens, when the hand of God reaches down and saves someone from a life-threatening or dangerous situation, or when someone is placed in the right place at the right time and just happens to have the right skill set for someone in need, or when the person in need may be dead if the helper hadn't come. Or it could be like this, in a curious moment when the trajectory of machine gun bullets seemed to bend. A friend of mine, Thomas Washington, was born in a small village in Uganda during the bloodthirsty reign of the dictator Idi Amin Dada. During his eight-year cancerous reign of evil, Idi Amin slaughtered more than 300,000 people. One of his tactics was to generate fear in the people by killing entire villages that refused allegiance to him. Idi Amin would line the entire village up side by side and watch while his army machine gunned them, killing everyone who stood there. This is what happened to Thomas Washington as a young boy. Tom told me how he remembers standing between his father and his grandfather as the machine gun fire came down the line towards him. He could hear the bullets hitting each person and he could see each body fall to the ground behind him, riddled with bullets. No one would survive these massacres, but somehow, in some divine way, the bullets passed by Tom. He fell down only because his grandfather fell into him as his body was hit and landed on top of him, making him appear like he was dead. This quickly turned providential as the inspecting eyes of Amin's army came by just to make sure each one had died. Today, Thomas Washington is a doctor and a world-famous oncologist practicing in Birmingham, England, saving people's lives from a different kind of cancer. Divine intervention is not always linked to death or the avoidance of death. Yes, sometimes God intervenes, and we never come close to seeing the face of death when He does. Some even say that in times like this, death is cheated. Yet, at other times, God seems to wait. He seems to wait to the last moment. Sometimes he waits till even after we have died to intervene. I've never been sure why, but it's clear God does wait. And then in all his waiting, he has reasons. And sometimes it's simply to change the calling of one of his servants. The Art of Praying the Scriptures, a new book from John Paul Jackson, is a fascinating journey into the hidden power of meditating on God's Word. For your gift of $50 or more to the ministry, we would like to send you this new book, a two-CD set teaching on Lectio Divina, and a study card to practice this spiritual discipline anytime, anywhere. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285.
I have a friend, I'll call him Joe. A number of years ago, Joe saw the Lord in a dream and the Lord told him he was going to become a pastor. Joe wasn't even a Christian at the time. However, as a result of the dream and the spiritual tug of war that ensued, Joe eventually did go on to become a pastor. 10 years later, while preaching, Joe experienced a second of two heart attacks. Later, while recovering in the hospital, Joe went into cardiac arrest and had an out-of-body experience. He was immediately standing on a street of gold, but at the same time, he could hear the doctors talking as they worked on him. It didn't dawn on him about what was going on because he was so taken in by everything he saw in heaven. After more than 45 minutes of looking around heaven, an angel told him he had to go back because he hadn't finished his assignment. But he also told him, your assignment is about to change. The angel said he would soon be working with homeless train kids. But Joe had never heard of anything like that. So at the, uh, Joe just decided to kind of go with it. And at the same time he heard the angel say this, Joe also heard a nurse shout, he's coming back. The next thing he felt was his body being jerked back onto the bed. Well, today, Joe is working with lost teenage young people who live under bridges in transient situations and live near train stations going back and forth in homeless states across the nation. Joe is meeting those kids, touching those kids, loving those kids, and telling them of the love of Jesus. As I have grown older and had time to observe more on how divine intervention works and what characteristics seem to follow those who had these type of experiences, I found some really interesting traits that they share. The first trait is that the more one follows the teachings of the Bible, the more often divine intervention plays a part in their daily life. This is where the entry level of divine intervention takes place in our lives. I call this common intervention. By common, I don't mean less valuable. I simply mean more people have this level of experience than other levels. Yes, yeah, there really are instances where God acts on behalf of someone who is not in relationship with Him. But that event usually happens in order to help the person shift the course of their life and embark on a journey for which God had created them. In other words, they come into relationship with Him. You might say it's God letting them realize that He's there wanting to help them more than they knew. The second trait is that those who have a servant's heart seem to experience more of the higher levels of divine intervention than others. It makes no difference if they're a mother at home with their children, a private in the army, or the president of a Fortune 500 corporation. The servant's heart seems to attract the attention of heaven. The third trait is that they recognize this happened for a purpose much larger than themselves. When they grasp this realization, they then come into the next era of their life. And if they come into agreement with what is presented to them in that aftermath, because something will be presented to, to them, the doors of opportunity seem to open at rates far faster than they had opened before. On the other hand, perhaps they're not really opening any faster. You might say that they simply now have eyes to see God's provision for the first time, or a provision that has always been there. Either way, it's as if they come into a greater understanding that they're part of God's master plan and their life is no longer their own. The fourth trait is that there's a shift of identity that takes place. They see themselves as having a destiny or a part to play, a purpose of God, and that part is to make a difference in the lives of others. The faster they grasp this fundamental shift in their, their thinking, it's then that they see that they were placed here for such a time as this. They now see the reality that it's impossible for their life not to have meaning. Learn how to discern the difference between what is God and what is good in the Supernatural series. Revolutionize the way you think about impossible and overwhelming situations. In this inspiring series, John Paul Jackson reveals how to take difficult situations and transform them into supernatural adventures. Experience the power of God to do something extraordinary. 
embrace the reality that today's choices predict tomorrow's results. For your gift of $50 or more to the ministry, we would like to send you the Supernatural series, including Maximizing Heaven's Help with Study Guide, Expecting the Miraculous, Naturally Supernatural, and two study cards. To order the Supernatural series, visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. No matter what the deist believes or the atheist does not believe, God is constantly watching for ways to be involved in our lives. Those who follow the desires of their own soul are subject to the dictates of darkness. They live by the rules of darkness whether they believe it, recognize it, or care to admit it. They've chosen to live by laws imposed on them by the ruler of darkness, who is Satan. Those who have chosen to allow themselves to be unshackled from darkness and be born into the kingdom of God no longer are subject to the laws of darkness, but the laws of the Creator. And as the Creator, God will always take action against Satan's plans, especially in the lives of those who follow Him and no longer live under the dictates of the tyrant. There are incidences that radiate with the essence of the divine, yet are beyond description. One word that sums up those divine interventions is the word numinous. Numinous simply means words, concepts, and logic are no longer sufficient to describe what has happened. It's a word that should only be used to describe the actions of God. The reality is, that all of creation is connected one to another. Man was made from the dust of this earth, and yet the earth longs for the righteous rule of man. Divine intervention occurs at the convergence of God's plans, meeting with man's spiritual preparation in the midst of the time and space of creation. Yes, divine intervention happens in situations that have to do with extreme life changes, also, it happens when you meet your spouse or someone almost dies or in a moment of crisis. But divine intervention also occurs when we're thinking about someone and they call us out of nowhere. It can also be seen when we pray for someone and they're healed. All of these and far more are given by God for a specific moment when lives will be changed. They form testimonies that encourage others concerning the greatness of God. They happen most often when we simply say yes to God. Divine intervention is also seen when you have a dream about someone, and as you tell them the dream, they understand what it means. But dreams and numbers, hmm, that's a mystery for another time.